time now for the formal part of our program. Uh, and we are very pleased to welcome back to the Wings Club Foundation, David Nealman. Uh, he last spoke here in November of 2006. So lots has happened since then, and uh, he will get us caught up. David is, as you know, the founder and chairman of Azul Airlines. Uh, and he truly is a remarkable entrepreneur. David created and launched four successful airlines so far. These include JetBlue and Morris Air in the US, WestJet in Canada, and of course Azul in Brazil. And as we in the New York area well know, JetBlue was an instant hit with travelers when it was formed. It was the first airline to earn $100 million annually within five years, has won numerous awards, and most importantly perhaps is the source of two of our key Wings Club members, Robin Hayes and Dave Barger. Azul was founded in 2008 and has quickly grown to become the largest airline in Brazil in terms of departures and cities served. And it's not just about quantity. Azul has been named best low-cost airline in South America by Skytrax for the last five years. David has had an extraordinary career in aviation and he clearly is not done that yet. He continues to innovate with Azura Airways, a new charter enterprise. Please join me in welcoming David Nealman. Well, thank you. <laughs> well, it's um, thank you. Um, thanks, Trey, for the commentary. <laughs> it's really great to be here. Um, just so many people in this room. I, I can't begin to, uh, you know, thank everybody enough for <clears throat> all they've contributed to, you know, what we to get together has, have collectively been able to accomplish. You know, you've got, um, you know, JetBlue founders uh, that are here. You've got Azul founders, some are the same <laughs> people. Um, you've got, you know, current Azul people. You've got, you know, Azul um, original investors, Azul current investors. <laughs> I mean, you just have just so many other people. You know, those uh, from you know Pratt and Whitney, or from Boeing and Airbus and Boeing. Did I say Boeing? Oh, I mean Airbus and Embraer. <laughs> Maybe someday Boeing slash Embraer. I don't know. Maybe we'll be partners with them as well. So, you know, things things happen in this business. Um, Amy Curtis, I'll just. Shout out Amy, because Amy's the one that came up with the JetBlue name. So if you ever think that I did that, I did not. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it was Amy, and it was on a phone call late Friday night. We kept it from being named uh, True Blue. That was the name. And we said, no, that's a frequent flyer program. So, um, But it's, uh, you know, um, so JetBlue was a great, a great part of my life. I mean, it was... Um, Amazingly, it's been almost 11 years since I left JetBlue, and honestly, I can tell you there hasn't been a day that's gone by that I haven't missed being there. You know, it's uh, it's it's a long it, it, it's, it was a, a tough you know kind of abrupt departure for me, um, but I'm you know proud of those that are there and particularly Robin leading the way, you know keeping the culture intact, and he's been uh, since he's become the CEO, he's been so welcoming to me, and I've. You know, been to headquarters and been down to talk to orientation again. So, I feel welcome back at my company, and that's that means a lot to me. Um, when I left uh, JetBlue, I, I wrote an email. I penned an email to to our crew members at the time, and I said, "Look, you know, I've always taught you that it's not really what happens to you in life; it's how you deal with it." And uh, so, I'm going to take this experience and I'm going to try and do something with it. And um, I had always um, wanted to do something in Brazil. Brazil was a, a special place to me. It was a place that I was born. My dad was a journalist down there, and I had served a mission there amongst some of the poorest people on earth, and, but some of the greatest people on earth. And it always bothered me how there was this class distinction and that people really couldn't um, fly. It was just for the, you know, I felt like the economy was built for the top 20 million people in the country and everybody else were kind of on the outside looking in. 
And so there was a revolution, uh, you know, an economic revolution going on there. There were some people that were joining in the class. There was about 100 million people that were what they call the C class down there that were starting to be employed. So I thought it would be um, a great opportunity to kind of, you know, drown my sorrows, I guess, and, and head to Brazil. And, uh, and there was a lot of great things that happened um, in my life since that time. But probably the greatest thing that's happened is, you know, coming home um, on that dreaded February time back in 2007, I spent five days, I never came home uh, for five days. I was in the command center uh, trying to get things up and going again, uh, personally handling a lot of things. And when I came home, uh, my daughter um, was there, my oldest daughter was there and she was, uh, Dad, I have a surprise for you. And I said, I'll, I'll take any surprises. And she said, you're gonna have your first grandchild. And um, so that was my greeting from coming back from there. And my 18th grandchild will be born in March. So I've got 18 grandkids <laughs> to mark now from then. So that was great. But there's also um, some great things that have gone on in Brazil. And I want to talk to you a little bit about um, you know, what's happened in Brazil. I think it's really an amazing story. Uh, when I first got down there, I was just stunned at uh, really how few people travel by air. Um, at the time, there were 46 million people that traveled by air in Brazil. At the time, I think the United States was, was over 700 million. And it's like, wow, I mean, there's almost 200 million people, there's 300 million people. I know they're you know, a lot you know, poorer, uh, you know, per capita incomes are a lot lower, but it could, didn't really explain it. When I looked at Mexico and Chile and, you know, pretty much every other country with comparable dynamics, they had two or three times as many travelers than Brazil had. And then when I got down there, you know, I realized bus tickets were expensive, you know, everything's kind of expensive in Brazil. And I, and I realized that, you know, you had a duopoly down there and, you know, fares were twice as high as there should be. And there was just a staggering amount of cities that didn't have air service. You know, they had had air service, but there was this comfortable duopoly where they just kind of didn't, didn't allow, you know, people didn't, didn't travel by air. So the number kind of that I had projected at that time, there should be 150 million. You know, kind of to the United States is 700 million because roads were either expensive uh, because they were told heavily, um, you know, because they were privatized or they were dangerous, you know, because uh, they weren't very good. And so, you know, we started out on this journey, took some, some people with me, some of them are here with me today, um, and they, they braved. Luckily, Trey um, dated a, a girl in college that spoke Portuguese, so he picked up a few words of Portuguese. Amir still has, doesn't speak much Portuguese, <laughs> eight years later. Uh, you know, and then a, a couple of little analysts that, uh, you know, one of them was FP&A analyst and another one was, um, you know, a, a, a revenue analyst and, and Abhi Shah and John Ryderson. And today, John's the CEO of the company and Abhi's the chief revenue officer. So these guys, I mean, I, I can't tell you enough of how, and the good thing about having TAP and Azul today for me is I can tell one, I can say, tell TAP, well, I'm in Brazil, and then I can tell Brazil, I'm at TAP, and then I can just stay home now. So it works perfect. <clears throat> but that, you couldn't do that if you didn't have a great team of people. So that's, that's a route map. I mean, we, have, we serve over 100 cities um, in Brazil. Uh, you know, our, our next closest competitor, I think, serves like 52 cities. Uh, so we're number one in destinations, uh, number one in, in, in we're, we're, and this is really key, and this relates to the value of our company. We're number one in 86% of all of our markets that we serve. So it's a really a market dominant story. Number one in domestic departures, a uh, third of all the departures in Brazil. Number one on on-time on, on time performance, you know, and top 10 in the world. Um, number one in customer satisfaction, and of course, number one in profitability. We have a fleet of 100, um, I think we're over that, 124 airplanes or so now, and we, you know, we fly um, pretty much all over Brazil, and you know, there's there's some unique challenges with being the only airline that flies to a lot of these cities. Um, you know, early on we would we'd have an air, and we have three aircraft types. We have ATRs, we have uh, Embraers, and now we have 320s and, and A330s. It was taking us two days to recover an airplane if it had a, a mechanical issue, and 
And so, you know, we have two Pilatus aircraft that fly crews and parts all night long to different outposts, and that's how we're able to keep our our, our cancellation uh, rates so low and our on-time percentage so high. So if we get a, an in-flight crew member that gets a stomach ache or sick in some far outpost and out to Floresta in the middle of the night, we can dispatch a Pilatus with a new crew member and have have that the person in place and ready to go for the 6 a.m. departure. So a lot of unique and interesting things that we deal with there, but it's a it's a it's just a tremendous um, operation. <clears throat> Uh, and this is, it's just all the blue dots is where we're number one, and you can see how much we dominate. Um, and we have, um, you know, the largest, in some of the largest population centers and smallest and all over the Amazon basin. Um, kind of the, my favorite place that we fly to is an archipelago that's an hour and a half off the coast of Recife. <clears throat> it's called Fernando Gironha. And so uh, if any of you win the tickets, you don't, um, Trey said you have to, on Portugal, you have to go, go to Portugal because you have to get to know Portugal. But if you want to go, if you don't have to go to Sao Paulo if you win the El Zul tickets, I would suggest you go to Fernando de Noronha. We actually serve Orlando to Recife, and Recife, you can catch a flight out there. It's the most amazing place on earth. They only let like 500 people a day on the, on the archi archipelago, and they have two of the top five rated beaches in the world, and no one's on them. So you'll love that place. <clears throat> So as I mentioned, we have three aircraft type. Um, each one serves different missions. I think one of the interesting things about, um, about uh, Brazil is that when you had, you know, Southwest Airlines, um, you know, taught that you should have one fleet type. You know, it's commonality of fleet, common, and that's great, and that's wonderful. And, um, you know, <laughs> we learned the lesson on pilots, how, how it's hard to kind of move pilots around. But you do have um, trip cost advantages, and trip cost is really key, especially in a country like Brazil, where fuel is 50% more expensive than it is in the United States. So when we started with our 195s and our 190s, we had a 35 to 40% lower trip cost uh, than our competitors. So it allowed us to go into markets they couldn't go into, or if they were flying one flight a day, we went in with three flights a day. And that was a, a, a way that we dominated. And then we realized, that there was a bunch of cities that we couldn't serve even with the Embraer's. And so the, the ATR has a 40% lower trip cost than the Embraer does. And so you can imagine the difference between an ATR and a, you know, a 737 or you know, an A320 with 180 seats. So it just allows us to penetrate these markets. And so, because we were the only game in town, and so we have different routes for, for different markets. Uh, now, with the new generation A320s that are coming on, uh, we can actually, um, we, can, we have the same exact trip cost with the 320 with 174 seats that we do with the 195 with 118 seats. And so as we move those planes in and out, it's, our profit margins are obviously on the increase because of that, you get 54 seats free. Now, we can't wait for the E2 as well. We've just got some great news on the E2, it's 17% less fuel burn now than the, than the 190. So, you know, things are really uh, rosy for us. We're, we're really excited. And the economic situation in Brazil, obviously, is, is perking up. Um, you know, we, um, values were such a big part of what we did at JetBlue. You know, we came up with our five values. You know, we live by those, safety, caring, fun, integrity, and passion. They were, they were you know, what we did, they were part of your you know, of our culture and, and you know, and, and the team has continued to do such a great job with the values um, at, at JetBlue. And so and the same thing, of course, we showed up there and we came up with our own uh, values and some of the words didn't work as well in Portuguese, so they're, they're you know, they're very similar. Um, but we, we created safety, consideration, integrity, pa uh, passion, innovation, and excellence. Those were the ones that we came up with in Brazil because of the language differences. And so our people um, just, it, it, it's just an amazing place to work. I mean, I, um, the mantra that I have in Brazil, and you know, th these, these are people that have, you know, their lives have been changed. And you know, I, I may not have been um, happy with what, you know, the decision at the time of the JetBlue board, but I can tell you there's 12,000 people in Brazil that are thrilled with the JetBlue board. They think it's the best thing that ever happened to them because it created a great, you know, a great company there and the over almost 25 million people a year that we fly. 
And so, you know, that number, that 50 million, 46 million number, um, approached um, 100 million, went back a little bit after the financial crisis, and now um, filling the next five years is on its way to 150 million, and we expect to take, we only took 50% of the first 50 million increase, we expect to take more than 50% of the next 50 million that, that, uh, of people that are flying in Brazil. Um, so just some other just pictures. If, you, if you've flown on JetBlue, you've flown on Azul. It's the same thing. You know, we have live television, um, you know, snacks and baskets and uh, smiling people. You can see, you, you think you're on a JetBlue flight there, don't you? Um, kind of, if it works, do it again. Um, we have our own branded snacks. Um, so if you have your own branded snacks. Um, but I, I was going to tell you this. So the, the most important thing to me is that I want everyone who works at the company, I want them to believe that this that it's the best job they've ever had. So in orientation, the first day we say, our goal is that this is the best job you ever had. And we want you to tell us if it's not. And you want to tell us what we can do better. And so as I go through the company and as I talk to people, just people say, I just want you to let you know this is the best job I ever had. Oh, good. Tell me why. You know, and then if someone doesn't say, I'll ask them, is this the best job you ever had? Why not? What can we do to do better? And so we're always striving. Um, you know, it's funny because it, so it was so antithetical to business culture in Brazil. You had this group of really nice people. If you ever know any Brazilians, they're just the, the nicest people ever. Um, no, yeah. Muito. <laughs> so they're just the, the most wonderful people, but, you know, they're just not given the ability to make decisions on the front line. They're just poorly managed. You know, people just don't take good care of their people. And so, you know, we, we just let our people say, you know, and, and I could, there wasn't a word in Portuguese for servant leadership. They're like, what do you mean servant leadership? <laughs> no, we're the leaders. We don't serve. We go, yes, you do. And so it was a whole cultural thing to teach people you need to serve being a leader. It's about servant leadership. And so it, it, it created this amazing, amazing culture um, that we have at the company where we, we just, um, you know, there was a... Um, a TripAdvisor survey that came out recently. And TripAdvisor, you know, there's lots of awards in this industry, but the TripAdvisor one, I, I think, I value a lot because it's actually people who, who vote, right? It's people, who, you know, they're online, and TripAdvisor gives the best comments from the airlines. And, um, you know, I saw that, I, I sent Robin an email and said, Robin, wow, congratulations on being named the fourth best airline in the world by TripAdvisor, that really is special. You're in great company. And of course, we finished third, so. <laughs> but it was, but it, it's, it's, it is a great accomplishment for JetBlue, but it, I mean, just to show you some little airline in Brazil that's been around, uh, you know, for less than 10 years was able to do it, but it's because we've got these ama amazing people. Um, we have kind of a unique thing. Um, actually, it's not even, we didn't make it up. It's Air New Zealand that actually created it. It's called, um, we call it Sky Sofa, where you can fold up part of the seat in coach and so you can do four seats and people can sleep and so it, people love that and so they can buy that that section of the airplane on our 330s um, so um, then we just you know our, our service standard is observe perceive and respond we call it OPA and and so our we teach our people to every single person on, there's not a flight we have where a person's not making their first airplane trip ever and then you people who are going every week. So we teach our people just to take care of our people, to observe them, make decisions on the front line. And so we just take care of everybody. I'm very proud of, of what our team's been able to accomplish down there. It's really transformed air travel in Brazil in a big way. We also took about 20% of, of Embraer's deliveries over a period of time when they really needed it too. So we have a very good relationship with them. These are MPS scores and all that. Okay, so I've never done this before. <laughs> um, I got called a lot uh, from the Portuguese government, the Brazilian government, you know, can you do something with TAP? And I said, no, 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 no. Can you make a visit over there? So I made a visit over there and I was kind of captivated by the country and, and the people and, um, you know, it's a very different country than Brazil. They speak sort of the same, 
Uh, <laughs> Trey says once he got over there and got in the cab, he couldn't understand a word the guy was saying. But it's a little bit different accent. Um, but it was, a, it was an airline that was, had really suffered uh, because it was government owned. Uh, one thing I didn't even know is that um, you know, the, the, in 1974, uh, the Communist Party took over Portugal and nationalized um, a lot of the important companies, and TAP was nationalized at that point in time, and was actually owned by the government until, you know, we privatized it. And so we had to uh, go over there and, and basically take over a company that had been owned by the government since 1974, but full of really good people. And I'll never forget uh, the day that w the privatization was announced, and I was just kind of going through the motions and you know, there was other things going on in Brazil that were difficult and, you know, it was kind of something I thought could help Azul. I didn't really, the impact fully, didn't fully hit me until um, th we had the, the announcement amongst, for the crew members over there. And they had this huge cafeteria that I've never seen anything like it before. It felt like something in Eastern Europe or something, <laughs> didn't it, Trey? I mean, it was like, and they put two, 3,000 people in this, in this place. And they were just, you could have, you could have dropped a pin when, when, I, when I went to speak. And I realized that there were like 12,000 people that worked at this company that if they didn't work at TAP, you know, they wouldn't have a job in aviation, not in Portugal. I mean, Portugal's a very small country. There's only 10 million people in the whole country. And then the enormity and the weight of that responsibility hit me at that time. And I realized that there was 10,000 families that depended um, on on, on that company, and not to mention all the shopkeepers and the restaurant owners and everyone else, that they needed us to bring people to Portugal and discover that great country. And so it's been a, a labor of, of love. <laughs> uh, Trey t went over there and, and, t and took on the responsibility of, of, of um, you know, Trey was principally the architect behind Azul, and he became the principal architect behind what we did at TAP to restructure it. And so we took the 71-year-old state-owned enterprise. The government could not invest in it by, by law, by European law. Uh, they couldn't. The planes were old. Um, there was some lending going on from Portuguese banks, um, you know, kind of because, you know, the, the Portuguese government appreciated them doing it, but that there was no, no new fleet and the, the old inefficient airplanes, tired onboard product, and uh, politically driven route system and over-reliance on, on connecting in the Portuguese-speaking world. And we basically came in with private ownership, uh, servant leadership, same thing, employee equity, profit participation, 380 million of euros investment, 53 new aircraft ordered, a new regional fleet replacement, thanks to Azul, um, a complete renovation of the existing fleet, uh, redefined onboard product, and develop Lisbon as a, as a world-class connecting hub. So that's all happened in a couple of years, and it's or in the process of happening. Um, we have 90 destinations in 35 different countries, a fleet of 88 aircraft, 22 wide bodies, uh, 14 million passengers, three three billion euros, 3.5 million a billion in, in revenue. Um, Fortress hub in Lisbon, um, you know, profitable airline. We've turned it around. It's become profitable and winning awards, the Kappa 2017 Airline Turnaround of the Year Award. So it's been, it's been quite a success story. And it's coincided with, because voila, you can actually get to Portugal now, uh, because we serve Boston and JFK with great connection agreements with, with JetBlue. Uh, people are now discovering Portugal, and it's becoming this hot new destination. And you know, it was interesting because nobody knew when I talk to people in the United States, I tell people in Portugal this, they go, oh, Portugal, I really want to go there someday. I hear great things about it. And now, I mean, I didn't know anyone who hadn't been to Portugal, uh, who had been to Portugal. Now I know everyone, you know, are going. I don't know. Who's been to Portugal? Okay, see, you've been a lot. Now the rest of you need to go because it's beautiful there. <laughs> I'm actually got a little project with the Azores. I'd like, I'd like to turn the Azores into kind of Hawaii East. It's a... It's a very beautiful place, so we're working on that right now. Um, so just a few more slides, and then I'll answer some questions. Um, relatively low costs, um, you know, kind of below Aer Lingus and kind of just above EasyJet. So we've, we've had a fun time kind of 
taking back market share. I mean, it was an experience where uh, they just kind of laid, laid, laid down and let Ryanair and EasyJet come in and invade the turf. And I said, no, no more of that. So we've gone to, um, uh, gone from 34% market share up to 48 and expect to be over 52% this year. So we're, we're building it. I think what's important is that um, between Azul and, and Azul flies to Portugal as well, but between Azul and TAP, 32% um, of all the people who go from Brazil to Europe fly on us. So we have a dominant market share. And it's, you know, the way that, you know, uh, JetBlue had, you know, dominance out of JFK and now out of Boston, you know, the way it's, it's much better if you can own markets. And that makes it much easier to, to have higher profit margins. And so we fly from between Azul and TAP. Uh, t TAP flies from 11, uh, 10 different destinations in Brazil to Lisbon. And we're, we are building it so you can go... There'll be, a, I don't know, I say 10, but North America, you'll be able to do, in the next few years, 10 destinations from North America over to Lisbon and on. And a, and a big part of that strategy, obviously, is, is the 321. Um, you can see that USA was the ninth um, place, and now it's gone to number three of our destinations, so the U.S. makes a big part of it. Um, I don't know if this, it's in the stack, but in, there is, uh, the 321, um, range of the LR uh, doesn't really work as well from interior Europe than it does. One of the great advantages, one of the reasons the Portuguese kind of dominated the early seas, you know, early on, uh, you know, 11th, you know, 10th, 11th century, was because they were on the water and it was easy for them to get going. Uh, and then the, the British came in and started um, t usurping their authority, but <laughs> Robin. Um, so I'm actually British, so um, of extraction. Um, so, so, but the, because it sits there, it sits so far in the ocean, we can hit from from Toronto to Washington with a 321, and so that gives us the ability to fly to a lot of secondary cities. Oh, it's good. So it gives us a chance to fly to a lot of secondary cities, and so we will be flying to, you know, every secondary city you can think of between Washington and Montreal on a year-round basis, seven days a week. And then the same thing works for northeastern Brazil. And we can switch wide body with narrow body from top to bottom. So it gives us a tremendous amount of fleet, uh, flexibility. And this just shows kind of, you know, with our, our partners in China, with, you know, what we do in Africa and, and what Azul does in Brazil together with JetBlue. Uh, you know, it's kind of formed a, a, a neat little uh, a way to, 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 to flow customers, which is really working well from all angles. The A330-900, we're getting that at, at Azul and at TAP. And it, actually, we're, we're, we're getting 18 airplanes in 15 months, Trey? Uh, 17 by the end of 19. Yeah. So 17 airplanes in 15 months, completely changing over our fleet. Um, not growth, so I'm not overgrowing it. We're just get, taking out old airplanes and putting in new. And uh, so we'll have that airplane, and then Azul's getting five more as well. That, this is the thing that shows uh, the range for, the, for you airline um, geeks like us. The green line is, is from Lisbon, and you can see how many more cities um, you can hit, because you, if you leave from Lisbon, then you can from either Paris or Madrid, based on those range charts. So um, new interiors on the aircraft. Trey's been really instrumental on, on getting all this done and um, has done a great job. So. So, um, I, I think, you know, I think some people just get in the airline business for the sake of being in the airline business. Um, you know, in the PR department was trying to formulate a story about me when I first started JetBlue. They asked my parents to send a bunch of pictures of me and my childhood. In Brazil, I had this, on my second birthday, I was in this little Tarzan suit, and I had this cake with this big airplane on it. And they said, that was the moment you became an aviation guy. I go, no, I can't remember that cake. Um, I'm not really an aviation guy. I'm just someone who, if they see an opportunity, then sees on that opportunity. And so if there's no opportunity exists, then there's no... And there was a huge opportunity in Brazil. Brazil had a, had a great opportunity. Um, and, you know, JetBlue had a great opportunity that existed at the time. And so, you know, 
you know, is there an opportunity? Um, is there is there an is there an opportunity in the United States? You know, I, there's challenges here. Obviously, I mean, it's obviously been a good run for airlines based on fuel prices being down. Um, you know, but there's challenges with lack of pilots and all kinds of things. So, you know, do, but do I think there's some communities that have kind of been left out? You know, of of kind of the hub and spoke. Um, Thing and, and you know it becomes very expensive, or you have to end up driving. You know what really drove Brazil is that you had people had to drive four hours to, to catch a flight, and there's a lot of communities today to catch an economical flight to catch a good quality service. Unless you're connecting to a hub, you have to drive two to four hours. So is there an opportunity there? You know possibly. You know is this something that should be forced? No. So. It's something that you know could transpire. I, you know, I don't know. I mean, I think Allegiance. You know, there's some great stories of, a, of an Allegiant. Um, you know, as opposed to a spirit that just tries to skim off what other people are doing and hope their fares don't get matched. You know, Allegiant actually has gone into cities and and created market in some of these cities, taking people to leisure destinations. So, you know, I, um, I think the airlines are doing a good job. I think whenever capacity gets mentioned as going up, things happen in the industry as of yesterday. And so there's obviously a lot of caution, but you know, obviously with wages going up and, and expenses going up, you know, as as these profits are being shared, um, you know, costs are going up. And so we'll see if there an opportunity develops. You know, what what I have been kind of eyeing is is kind of I think there's an opportunity um, in, in I, as you know, I've become I love the right aircraft on the right market. I think it really works, and I think sometimes if you do a one-size-fits-all, there's not a lot of things that you miss, you know, because if you have a lower trip cost by 40%, that means if you're both flying 100 passengers on an airplane and your trip cost is in 40% lower, then you're making 20% margin and your competitor is losing 20% uh, if you both have 100 people on the airplane. And so, um, you know, I think as kind of, the E2s come in and the Embraer 100 and the 190s become available. You know, if, if we, you know, we can figure some of the things out on the maintenance cost to keep them reasonable um, and as the capital costs have come down dramatically for these airplanes as they're being replaced, you know, there may be an opportunity in, in a leasing platform to maybe go around the world and teach other airlines and say, you know, look what Azul is able to do in Brazil. You know, look at some of these other examples. Here's some pretty low-cost capital airplanes, you know, where we can show you, you know, the maintenance costs. So I think bringing kind of the airline intelligence into a leasing company platform, you know, may make some sense. So I think, you know, that's kind of something that I'm intrigued about lately. So, but I've still got a lot of work to do here on these two airlines. We got we got a lot of stuff to do. Okay, questions. Hi, Chris Frankel from GRA. What uh, what led you to uh, decide on the ATR type instead of, say, the Q400 at Azul? Um, good question. So um, the Q400 has a big advantage on the ATR, and that's speed. Um, you know, but with speed, you lose. Um, you know, you get more fuel burden, and you know the operating costs are higher. Uh, we didn't need the speed. So our, our cities were relatively close together. Uh, we don't fly an ATR more than an hour and a half. That's really rare. They're all under an hour. So um, with that, it was better to have uh, lower operating costs and a plane that just uh, flew a little bit slower. So uh, that was why, it, that was an obvious choice for us. I wanted to ask, uh, you mentioned the fuel costs being about 50% higher in Brazil than in the US. Right. Uh, what your plans were to deal with that, and particularly whether you were interested in alternate fuels. Yeah, well, um, the plan to deal with it is to get NEOs and E2s. <laughs> That's our best plan to deal with it. I mean, unfortunately, uh, we have state and local taxes in Brazil. That Every state has a different tax, and so we've been able to leverage some of that down by providing service to certain states. But uh, there's really not much you can do except for conserving fuel. Alternate fuels, uh, I've never seen an alternate fuel that could come close to even $100 a barrel. So, I mean, I'm not trying to save the world. I'm just trying to get people flying. I'm letting the saving of the world to other people. I don't I have enough to do. So um, it would be nice to try and do it all, but I can, I've just got to, you know, 
have to have some priorities. Appreciate it. And one more back there. Hi, David. This is Kim, um, journalist with Fly Global. I understand that Tab and Azul were starting a trans-Pacific joint venture at some time. Is there any progress made on that front? And how about even exploring potentially something with JetBlue, especially now that US, Brazil, Open Skies have made some progress? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, those are all things that we can talk about. And I mean, you know, one of the things that, you know, Open Skies in Brazil hadn't approved Open Skies, has still not, but you can't do JVs without Open Skies. So that's a possibility. I think there's some things we could do with JetBlue there. And, and uh, there obviously between Azul and, and uh, TAP, um, it's, it's also a possibility, and it's something that we're, we're looking into. Great. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. So, David, thank you for coming back. Uh, we'll have you again in another 12 years or so, I suppose. But uh, thanks for being here. We wanted to present you with this prize.